In this video, we're going to be looking at the year eight topic of combustion. And this is a chemistry topic and it's going to cover everything that is also in the textbook pages. And you can find the textbook pages on Google Classroom. So the success criteria and things that we're going to be able to do by the end of this topic is we're going to look at how we burn hydrocarbons and hydrogen. We're going to look at word equations. We're going to look at oxidation and the fire triangle and then finishing off with pollutants and global warming. So the first part that we're going to look at is 888EA and that is burning fuels. So what is a fuel? Well, a fuel is a chemical substance from which stored energy can be released by burning. So all fuels will have an energy inside it. And when we burn it, it will then give off energy. And it tends to form give off energy in the form of heat and light. And an example would be like that burning of wood. So examples of fuels would be hydrogen, coal, wood or even natural gas and the energy is released when we react it with oxygen. Now a fuel cell is a substance or as a, a setup that allows us to use hydrogen in order to burn the hydrogen to get energy from it and it's where we use hydrogen as a fuel to power cars or vehicles and this is known as a fuel cell so we tend to find it inside cars and we burn the hydrogen very very carefully and we do that by adding oxygen and we're going to make h2o or water now it's very important this is done very carefully because this substance of hydrogen is extremely flammable and that means it can catch fire easily. And an example of this is the Hindenburg disaster, which you can see in this diagram here. The Hindenburg was a, something called a Zeppelin, which was basically a big balloon that was filled with hydrogen gas. And it was able to fly similar to a plane between country to country and it used engines and a hydrogen gas but the problem that was it contained hydrogen and there was an accident where there was a spark of a flame inside the zeppelin and all of the hydrogen caught fire and you can see that we got a huge explosion and unfortunately there are a number of people who died due to this accident and it was because of this accident that we stopped using hydrogen as a fuel in things like zeppelins but we can use it in cars because they only use a very small amount so in order to burn hydrogen we have to give it a spark like a lighter and we have to then have be doing this in the presence of oxygen in order for it to burn once the hydrogen is burned it will or once that spark allows it to catch fire, it will continue to burn without us having to put anything else in. So that's what we mean by no more energy input. And then the energy is released to the surroundings. So it gives off heat and light. And what we see is the temperature going up. So the energy is being released from combustion in form of heat or light and it will continue until we use up all of our reactants. So when the hydrogen runs out, the burning stops. It will continue to burn and burn and burn until we have no more hydrogen. Now we can also use an, a different type of fuel in order to burn for use in cars and we call these hydrocarbons. These are substances that contain hydrogen and they contain carbon and we get them from oil. Okay, so from an oil well and you can you know that oil is that black sticky substance. We can process it and we can get petrol and diesel from these and we call these fossil fuels 
And these are hydrocarbons are burned and they produce carbon dioxide and they produce water. So we have the carbon and the hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to give us carbon dioxide. And we also have the hydrogen reacting with oxygen to give us water. So this is an example of what it looks like. Propane is our fuel. We are reacting it with oxygen gas and we are making carbon dioxide and water and then we get our energy in the form of heat and light. Now it's important that we can know that we've made carbon dioxide and water so we have to do tests for these and you need to know these two tests for your assessment. So the carbon dioxide formed will turn lime water cloudy or milky. Now you've probably carried out this experiment where you had a test tube and a straw and you blew through the straw and it turned the liquid cloudy. That's because it was carbon dioxide. And you can see it will look something like this on the right hand side. Water will turn a special type of paper called cobalt chloride paper from blue to pink when it comes into contact with water. And you can see that over here. We can also display all of our substances in a word equation. And there is a separate video on how to calculate or sorry, how to write out word equations on this YouTube channel. So please feel free to check that out if you're not sure. But in general, we have our reactants on the left hand side, an arrow, and then our products on the right hand side. And a few helpful hints, our reactants are going to do things like combine or decompose or react together and the products are going to be the things that are formed or made. So in your sentence you want to try and find those answers, uh, those words. So a couple of questions. First of all, what is a fuel? So a fuel is a substance that releases stored energy when burned. And what's the product formed when hydrogen reacts in a fuel cell? Well, we said the hydrogen is reacting with oxygen and it is going to form H2O or water. And then three ways in which energy can be transferred to the surroundings. Well, we can transfer it in the form of heat and of light. And we can sometimes also transfer it in the form of sound because you may hear the flames as well. A word equation for the reaction of carbon with oxygen. Well, remember, we have our arrow in the center and we have the things that are reacting. So that is carbon plus oxygen and we make carbon dioxide so that goes on the right hand side of the arrow and our two tests well carbon dioxide turns lime water cloudy And water is going to turn our cobalt chloride paper. It goes from blue to pink. So let's move on to the second section, which is about, about oxidation. So when we're talking about a chemical name, we are using that to refer to the elements that are in 
the substance. So water has the chemical name of hydrogen oxide because it contains hydrogen and oxygen. If we add something like CH4, that would be carbon hydride because it has carbon and hydrogen. When an element reacts with oxygen and it forms an oxide, we call this oxidation. So when we have hydrogen reacting with oxygen, we will I'll undergo oxidation and we will form hydrogen oxide. Now hydrogen and carbon are non-metals, so they will form non-metal oxides and metals can react in order to form metal oxides. Now you can see some examples of the reaction of hydrogen and magnesium. These links will be in the description below so you can check out these videos. Now in a chemical reaction it is important to remember that mass is never lost and it is never gained. We cannot make mass out of nowhere and we cannot have mass disappearing and we call this the conservation of mass. So no new atoms are made, no new atoms are disappearing. All they do is they rearrange. So if you look at the example here, if I have six zinc atoms and six oxygen atoms, they are going to have an oxidation reaction and we're going to form zinc oxide. And zinc oxide has 12 atoms, six zincs and six oxygens. So we have not lost any of our oxygens or any of our zinc, they have just rearranged. Now in some reactions it might look like the mass has increased. So if you take a set of scales and you put your metal on top of it and then you set it on fire, what you might see is the number could go from five grams up to seven grams. Now it is not that we are adding in we are adding in atoms, so that's why we're getting more mass. It is because it is combining with the oxygen in the air. We just can't see the air, and then it forms this metal oxide. So this was the example we looked at a minute ago. We had zinc metal burning with the oxygen in the air and we form zinc oxide and this is our oxidation reaction now until 1772 scientists thought that substances contain something called phlogiston now when substances were burned what they thought was that this substance was given off and it was released leaving this ashy powder okay and this was used sometimes to explain why a mass went down or something seemed to be lighter after we burned so what they thought was that we had wood that would contain lots of this substance we would burn it and we would be left with ashes and this would have a lower mass and what they thought was that it was giving off this substance phlogiston okay now what they actually discovered through lots of careful experiments that you don't need to know the details about was that the theory wasn't right and actually what it was giving off was oxygen so it was these experiments that actually led to the discovery of oxygen. We didn't know that oxygen existed before this. And these experiments also confirmed that we had heat and light energy being released. And that was showing that we were transferring energy when we burn something. So let's look at some more questions. We want to write out a word equation for each of the following here. So we have magnesium plus oxygen is going to make magnesium 
oxide. Remember, all of these are going to make something oxide. So iron plus oxygen is going to make iron oxide. Copper plus oxygen is going to make copper oxide. Question two is saying if 2.4 grams of magnesium is burned in air to form four grams of magnesium oxide, what type of reaction is this? Well, when we're burning, there are two different words. We can either say it is a combustion reaction or it's this new word, oxidation, because we are reacting it with oxygen. And we want to know how much oxygen has been used. Well, if we started with 2.4 grams of magnesium and we ended with 4 grams of our magnesium oxide, the difference between these two numbers has to be how much oxygen we had. Because we know that 2.4 grams of magnesium plus the oxygen is going to give us 4 grams of magnesium oxide. So we can figure out how much oxygen by doing 4, take away 2.4, which gives me 1.6 grams. Explain what is meant by the term conservation of mass. Well, that means that the mass of the reactants is equal to the mass of the products. So the chemicals you start with, whatever they weigh, is going to be the same weight or same mass as the chemicals that you end with. And then draw a particle diagram to show the reaction of one carbon atom with two oxygens to form carbon dioxide. So we're just going to draw our particles as circles. So this is carbon plus two oxygens and these are going to react to make a compound of carbon dioxide. And it will look something like that. So now we're going to move on to fire safety. So combustion reactions or these burning reactions are a new word that we call exothermic. And that is just a fancy word for saying that they release heat energy or the heat energy exits the product exothermic exits. Now some fuels will release more energy than others and what we can do is we can burn the fuel and we can check the temperature change and the higher the temperature change or the hotter the fuel gets when it's burning the more energy it is given out. Once a substance starts to burn it will continue to burn even if we take away the heat source. So we've seen this if we take a candle and we light a candle using a lighter, you don't have to stand over the candle holding the lighter on it the whole time. You only have to put the lighter to the, the wick and the candle and then you can take it away and it will continue to burn as long as it has three things. And we summarize these in the fire triangle. We need the fuel, we need heat or temperature and we need oxygen. If we take away any of these then our fire goes out. So for example if we use up all of our fuel the fire stops. If we take away the oxygen like putting the lid on a candle it stops. If we cool it down by putting water or a fire extinguisher then the, the fire stops. So this is our fire triangle and we need all three of these things in order for the fire to keep going. 
Any substance that is very likely to cause fires are labelled with hazard symbols. And we've covered hazard symbols before back in year seven. And there are three that you need to know. This one here means flammable. So it means it catches fire easily. This one here means it is oxidizing, which means it reacts easily with oxygen. And this one here is explosive, which means exactly what it says, that it may explode. So if you see any of these on a substance, you should never have an open flame near them because all you're doing is putting yourself at risk because they are hazardous. But what happens if we do have a fire and we need to put it out? Well, the best thing that we can do is use a fire extinguisher. And fire extinguishers are used for two reasons. One, to control a fire or to completely extinguish or put out the fire. So extinguish is another word for put out. And they do this by doing one of two things. They either cool it down or they stop the oxygen. So remember our fire triangle, we needed the fuel, we needed oxygen, and we needed the temperature. So if we cool it down, then we are removing that part of the, the temperature of the fire triangle. If we stop the oxygen, we are removing that part and then the fire goes out. Now, what's very important is we need to make sure that we use the correct fire extinguisher. They are not all the same. And we can sometimes be putting ourselves in more harm or more danger if you use the wrong type. So you have to usually be trained on fire safety using which fire extinguisher to use. So there are four different types. You don't need to know too much about these, but you need to be aware of the four different types that we can use. So we have got water, which is red. We have foam, which is yellow. Dry powder, which is blue. Or carbon dioxide, which is black. And I'll post this link here on the fire extinguishers in the description below. Now, sometimes we can use water to put out fires, but it should never, ever be used if you have oil that is on fire. Now, water and oil do not mix. And what happens if you put water in is the water very, very quickly turns into steam and the steam then pushes the oil away and it causes the fire to spread. So what you see is you see essentially an explosion of the boiling flaming oil that then causes the fire to spread. And again, I will post this link in the description to show you what happens when you put water onto a grease fire. It is extremely dangerous. If you are ever in the situation where you are, ha do have a grease fire, don't put water on it, you take a damp washcloth and or a towel and you put that over it or if in doubt always call 999 for any fire issue just to be safe so now we're going to go on to section four which is air pollution now when we're talking about combustion there are actually two different types of combustion and the first one is called complete combustion and this means that we are burning with lots and lots of oxygen and whenever we do this it means every single atom in our carbon or our hydrocarbon is going to react with the oxygen to make carbon dioxide or water and we call this complete combustion because it, the substance is completely burning but sometimes we can get incomplete combustion and that means that there is not enough oxygen so not all of the carbon or all of the hydrogen will react and if we get this happening we make carbon monoxide some carbon dioxide some water and some soot and soot 
is a black powder and it is actually just the carbon. So if we have our hydrocarbon like this reacting with oxygen, we will make carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, water, and some leftover carbon. Now this can happen in engines in the car. And carbon monoxide is a very, very poisonous gas. And soot, as we said, is the carbon that has been left when it has not reacted. So there's a summary that we have complete combustion, we make water and carbon dioxide. If we have incomplete combustion, so not enough oxygen, we're going to make carbon monoxide and our fine particles of soot. Now, why is that a bad thing? Well, we're going to be releasing that carbon monoxide and that soot into the air, and those are poisonous, so we don't want to be breathing them in. Now, as well as that, some hydrocarbons can contain sulfur or nitrogen, and when these burn, they'll make sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide, and we call these pollutants. So these two things, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxide, as well as carbon dioxide and soot, are all pollutants. And what that means is they can damage the environment or living things. So you can see here that we've got all this smoke coming out of our factory and it can cause things like smog which you can see here, and it stops visibility, you can't see things, and that air is not nice to breathe. Now, pollutants like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide can cause two major issues, acid rain and smog. So acid rain is when the rain becomes slightly acidic, and when it falls, it doesn't damage humans, but it can damage animals, and it can damage plant life. So we want to avoid acid rain as much as possible. And smog is when we get particles of soot in the air and it causes poor air quality. And it means if you have any lung problem, you can't breathe properly or it can actually cause breathing problems for people who are healthy. And of course, we want to avoid that. We need to make sure we are taking in only as much oxygen as we need. So this is an example of acid rain. So we have our sulfur dioxide and our nitrogen dioxide coming from factories. These dissolve into the water vapor that is in the atmosphere and then it falls. And it means the rain is acidic and it can harm our plants and animals. So what we might do is we might do specific reactions to stop any of these gases coming out in the chimney. We might use something called a catalytic converter that removes nitrogen from our exhaust gases and it stops that. Or we can add substances like calcium carbonate to our soil and it stops it from becoming acidic and it means that we are not damaging the, the soil anymore. So any gases from cars can be treated to remove pollutants and then that stops them from harming the environment. And the way that we do that in a car is using a catalytic converter. And that's what this diagram is showing us. So we have all of our poisonous gases, carbon monoxide, nitrogen oxide, and our hydrocarbons, the things we don't want. So these are our bad gases. They pass through the catalytic converter. And then we get have things like platinum and we get sp special reactions happening here and then it gives us carbon dioxide, water and nitrogen and all of these things are good. Carbon dioxide isn't great for the atmosphere but it's much better than carbon monoxide and nitrogen oxide. We also make water and nitrogen which are already all around us. 
Now, any country that has very large industrial processes, any country that's got lots of factories or anything that is going to burn fossil fuels are going to have problems with pollutants. The most common is China, the USA, and the UK can be quite bad as well. So in Europe, there are laws about how many fossil fuels can be burned, and they do that so that they're stopping pollution. And in 1997, the Kyoto Protocol was established by the United Nations. And what this was, is was an agreement for all countries that burn fossil fuels to stop burning as many fossil fuels and to reduce air pollution. And there are 192 countries in the world that are part of this protocol. And it is all about stopping pollution. And they do that by using less fossil fuels. And you can read up on the Kyoto Protocol on um, the internet if you're interested. So explain why a truck might give off lots of soot in its exhaust fumes. Well, if it's giving off soot, it means that we're getting incomplete combustion. And the exhaust. And what that means is we are get we do not have enough oxygen. Now we want to write a word equation for the formation of sulfur dioxide. So remember we have our arrow, we are forming sulfur dioxide, so that is our react, uh, that is our product. And we form it from sulfur, and we burn the sulfur so it is reacting with oxygen. And then question three, what do we mean by the word pollutant? Well, pollutant is a substance that damages or hurts the environment. So it's basically things that we don't want in our environment or they can hurt or damage living things like humans or plants or animals. So describe how burning fossil fuels causes pollution. Well, this burning can make carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, or nitrogen dioxide. These gases then dissolve and water and the air and then they can cause acid rain or smog being formed. And then give an example of two pollutants and what effect they have on the environment. Well, we just said that sulfur dioxide can cause acid rain and carbon or soot particles can cause smog and these cause our breathing issues that we've talked about already. So the last section is looking at global warming and looking at the greenhouse effect. So carbon dioxide is formed when fossil fuels are burned. We've already said that in previous slides. And carbon dioxide is what we call a greenhouse gas, and it contributes to something called the greenhouse effect. So when we get heat energy coming from the sun, it comes into our atmosphere, but sometimes instead of bouncing off and releasing into the atmosphere, it can become trapped by these greenhouse gases. And when we have all of this heat energy being trapped, it causes the surface of the earth to warm up. 
and this is what's called the greenhouse effect. So let's look at a diagram to show this. So we have our sun and we have the heat leaving the sun and it comes and it hits earth. Now this happens all the time, this is what we want, this is how we keep the earth warm. But most of it should reflect out. But because we have greenhouse gases, what we get sometimes is we get a bit of a barrier. So this is our layer of greenhouse gases. And this stops the heat from getting back out. So instead of being reflected, it becomes trapped. So this is our trapped heat. And when it gets trapped, it causes the earth to be, get, be getting warmer. Now, over time, the temperature of the earth has changed. And it can be for lots and lots of different reasons, like the tilt of the planet or how much energy the sun is giving out. But if you notice, in the last 20,000 years, the temperature has went up. And that temperature has went up due to humans. Now, over the last 100 years, humans have produced more and more carbon dioxide. And this is because of the amount of fossil fuels that we burn. So you can see going from the year 1900, we gave off about 2,000 million tonnes. of carbon dioxide. If we come now to 2010, here we're giving off about 32,000 million tonnes of carbon dioxide. So we've released all of that carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and remember carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas. So the more of it we have, the more heat is going to be trapped. And that has caused the temperature of the earth to increase. So increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the air causes the greenhouse effect to be worse. So it means that we get trapped heat energy. And that causes global warming and that can lead to climate change and climate change is very very bad for our planet because it, it can cause melting ice caps rising sea levels and extreme weather patterns and these are all things that we want to avoid so let's finish off with some questions so we want to draw a diagram to show how the greenhouse effect happens so we're going to have the earth and it is surrounded by the atmosphere and that contains our greenhouse gases and then we have the sun and we get heat energy from the sun coming into earth and then it is reflected but it is trapped and it bounces and bounces and it stays. So this is our trapped heat energy. So that's our diagram. So then how can we explain that? Well, how carbon dioxide helps to cause the greenhouse effect? Well, carbon dioxide is a greenhouse gas which traps the heat from the sun and this is the greenhouse effect. And why do we think the temperature of the earth has increased over the last hundred years? Well, we burn, or we are burning more 
and more fossil fuels, which releases more CO2 or carbon dioxide. So the CO2 is trapping more air. Sorry, it's trapping more heat. And what do we mean by global warming? Well, global warming is the increasing temperature of the Earth due to the greenhouse effect. And two effects of global warming well, we have melting ice caps and extreme weather. So that's everything for combustion. If we go all the way back to the start, we can have a look at our success criteria. So you should now be able to do all of these things based on everything in this video looking at combustion, oxidation, the fire triangle, air pollution and global warming. If there's anything you're not sure about please feel free to leave a comment below and we hope to see you back on the channel in future for any other videos you might find useful.